The following program is presented by the HTM Podcast Network. Welcome to another episode of Turnbuckle Talk in partnership with TheChairShot.com, presented by the Hitting the Marks Podcast Network and in association with NDPW.com. Turnbuckle Talk is sponsored by CollarAndElbowBrand.com, where you get 10% off when using promo code JKPODCAST. Turnbuckle Talk is also partnered with Phoenix at FNXFit.com, where you get 15% off all your health supplements simply by using promo code TBTALKPOD. Follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter by searching at TV Talk Pod. Listen on Podbean, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere you catch your favorite programs. And now, pro wrestling fanatics, are you ready? Here are your hosts, Mighty Joe Morin and Carl Carafel. That is right, everybody. I am Carl Carafel. And if you take a look on that screen, just to my side, we have got mighty Joe Morin. For those listening to the audio, you'll hear his voice in a moment. And if you take a look down below watching this video, we are joined once again by friend, mentor, and all-around great guy. We are joined by Mr. Ryan K. Bowman. It's, hey, it's everybody. Great. It's great to join you guys today, but can you see me? I'm I'm still blind from all those big explosions that went off last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will uh, definitely get to, to that because we will be. Uh, you know, go- you guys know I I put my shades on today just for that damn joke. I I, I, I as soon as I saw the mono, I was like, yeah, I knew what was kind of going it. on there. But yeah, man, it's um, it's been kind of a, of a crazy week around here. It, uh, it's good to be busy. We're doing lots of stuff. You know, we've got more stuff kind of going on tomorrow as, as well. Kind of uh, we get to uh, we'll mention later on this show. Uh, my, myself, Ryan, our friends Rick and Jargo, we sat down with Dr. Tom Pritchard earlier this week. I mean, just man, we've been doing we're doing quite a bit. It's uh, um, strangely enough, it's been kind of a, a busy week in the world of professional wrestling, and we've uh, been uh, uh, dealing with a lot of it. So it's uh, it's a good kind of busy though. Definitely is a good kind of busy. Um, I mean, I myself, unfortunately, uh, was not able to make the meet with uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard, um, unfortunately. But I'm glad that at least Mighty Joe was there to be able to uh, give us a little bit of insight, uh, probably at a later time in uh, on that experience, which I'm sure was absolutely fantastic. It was. It was definitely something. But uh, other than that, um, let's start with you, Carl. How have things kind of been going this uh, past week? I know uh, here uh, we've actually been starting to get some warmer weather, and it's maybe uh, spring is finally on its way. But, uh, I mean, we didn't really have much of a winter uh, here this year. I don't know what it was like for you guys, but uh, uh, here where I'm at, it's been a relatively, I think I broke out the snowboard maybe twice this year to clear some snow. That's about it. For us here in northern Ontario, we are in first false spring as uh, many would call it (laughs) um yeah we've had some warm days but cold cold nights um it's been yeah yeah like negative 15 celsius um on the night shifts Uh, i was doing the day shifts uh, for a majority of the week so i got a little bit of that sunshine but still even then it was still cold because there was lots of wind that was happening so that kind of sucked but uh other than that Hey, I'm still alive, I'm still kicking, and I'm still here to do Turnbuckle Talk. Absolutely. All right, as well, let's kind of get to our first talk before we get to kind of our the main reason why we're here. We're going to talk about uh, EW Revolution, but I thought to, to kind of kick things off here, something that kind of flew below my radar, I'm sure maybe for you guys it, it did as well. Um, Davey Boy Smith Jr. looks like he has signed a deal with the WWE. I mean... 
it's on the Wikipedia profile. It's on some of the places, but it's one of these things where it was kind of like a really covert kind of thing that's happened here. Let me, I want to pick your brain on this, Ryan. Um, do you have any kind of information about this? If this is even kind of confirmed at this point, because it's one of those things where like, it's like it happened, but it was like very hush hush. You know, maybe WWE doesn't feel like Harry Smith is that big of a high profile person, so they didn't promote it that much. But yeah. to me, you know, seeing his work in MLW and what really pretty much all over the world, I think he's got the potential to be, uh, you know, a star. It's hard to say that anytime someone yeah. signs with WWE, particularly because you just never know how they're going to be pushed. But I mean, he's got the size, he's got the skill, obviously, he's got the pedigree. I mean, mm-hmm. there, there, there's no doubt about that. Um, I don't know, Carl. What do you think? I mean, as a as a fellow Canadian or a fellow, I shouldn't say. Well, I, I don't know if Harry's actually from Canada, but I know he was trained <laughs> in Canada. Such a good question. But you know, as as a guy that you know worked in the ring, what do you think his potential is? I, I think the the potential that he has is is the world. To be honest with you, um, going into the WWE right now, hopefully they put him down in NXT. I shouldn't say down, but I hope they use him in NXT. Yeah. Um, I think for for him, at least, to be able to build up that name a little bit more. I mean, everybody knows the name Davy Boy Smith, right? So yeah. to be able to build that name just a little bit more and kind of put his own um, personality onto it, it would be beneficial for him to be uh, going through NXT and, uh, you know, making his way all the way to the top, winning that NXT championship, and then at some later time, making his way over to a Raw or a SmackDown from there. So uh, I think beneficially for him and character-wise, NXT is is the best spot for him to go, and hopefully that's where they're going to put him. Do you think it's better for him to go by the name Harry Smith or to use Davy Boy Smith Jr.? as his name. Cause a lot of people have said maybe that wouldn't be a good idea. Davey boy Smith was yeah. loved by the fans. So wow. I say, why not? I mean, he is yep. the junior. Mm-hmm. He is his son. So why not use it? I, I think it's, it's perfectly fine for him to use Davey boy Smith junior. Cause that's who he is. That's who he is. And, you know, yeah. Bob Orton started out that way. He was Bob Orton Jr. for a long time, and then he just yep. dropped the junior. You know, there's there's a lot of guys that have kind of – even uh, Ted DiBiase, you know, who was adopted by his father. I believe he went by Mike DiBiase Jr. for a while and eventually, you know, dropped that moniker. So I, I totally understand it. I, I think at the end of the day, Harry's going to stand on his own. You know, he, he's got the talent, whether it's with WWE or he ends up – being a star in Japan or, or in AEW. I mean, I think anybody, you know, who isn't blind as I just pretended to be (laughs) earlier (laughs) when we came on the show, anybody who can take a, I mean, he passes the eye test as we always say. Yes. Well, you had mentioned Japan, uh, Ryan, and honestly, that's where I kind of expected him to kind of go. Cause I mean, his most recent stint, I guess would have been in uh, an MLW and a little bit in all, all Japan, but I mean, been relatively quiet in the meantime. I'm just, for me, I just wonder how he fits into w, uh, w, w, sorry, WWE. I don't know why I can say the three letters today. Uh, whether it be Raw, SmackDown, or, or NXT, I just, I, I could, I'm concerned of where he actually fits in there. That, that, that's my only thing because I don't know. It just, it feels strange. Like for, for me, it almost feels as though. That this may sound a little strange, but maybe we're just we're getting him in because maybe we're looking to induct his dad into the Hall of Fame and they want him to be part of the company for when they go and do it. I think I'm wondering if maybe it's just something that kind of simple. I, I I'd agree with that actually. I think yeah. that's probably something that they're looking at. You know, I mean, we've all seen where they've brought people in just just to induct him, like right. with Sting, just with Kurt Angle, where pretty much they didn't have much for the actual guy as a performer, but they wanted to have that hall of fame moment. Well, obviously David boy Smith can't have his hall of fame moment because he's right. unfortunately passed on. So maybe they want to bring him in just so he, like you said, Joe, like he can give the speech yeah, and get the big applause and, you know, and put his dad in and then he'll be kind of, and I hate to use the word token because that sounds so bad, but mm-hmm. you know, maybe he's a token guy in WWE. Who knows? Um, I hope not because he certainly has the potential to be something special. Yeah. 
Because I, I personally think it'll be a relatively short stay, and then coming out of WrestleMania after you know if they they do a Hall of Fame uh, thing this year, which I imagine that I guess they would kind of have to at this point. That from there, it's like I said, it's probably just a short term deal, and I, I see him hopping right back to to New Japan uh, to get in there to get involved with the the G One and possibly Wrestle Kingdom and all that. that. That's that's kind of what I'm anticipating. It's just a short stint to get his dad to the Hall of Fame, which, I mean, is obviously <laughs> uh, probably in most people's opinions sorely overdue uh, to get his dad into the Hall of Fame. So, I definitely hope that that is not the case, uh, to yep. be perfectly frank with you. Um, they could have Harry Smith yep. or Davy Boy Smith Jr., whatever you want to call him, they could have him come in and do whatever is needed for Hall of Fame, people will be able to 100% recognize who that is. Oh, yeah. They'll know. Yeah. And with the amount of times that the WWE has gone and mentioned other companies on their programming before, it would just be a simple matter of saying, you know, Davey Boy Smith Jr., who has competed with, you know, All Japan Pro or, or whatever, right? And then people will know that, yes, he is a worker, he is a performer, so he, you know, kind of has this ability to be able to maybe accept this on behalf of his father, right? Um, so it doesn't matter if, if you know, they, they do bring him in for a short stint, uh, you know, for this reason. Mm -hmm. If that's what it is, I think that that's the wrong reason 100% the wrong reason to do it because he is talented. Mm -hmm. uh, he's as talented as his father. He definitely sure. 100% is. And they, they really should not use him, but they, they really should have him as a competitor and not just a stepping stone for Hall of Fame. Yeah. Well, time will tell. We'll, we'll see what actually happens. Uh, I would definitely agree with you that maybe NXT, I think, would be kind of the... Uh, the most kind of fertile kind of place for him to be. I think go to Raw and SmackDown and he'll maybe be reminded why he left the last time. <laughs> so um, I, I think that uh, that's likely the best place for him uh, to, to be because then I think he, he would uh, feel, you know, not too hampered there. So uh, I would recommend it, sir, NXT or maybe just uh, sit tight, do the Hall of Fame thing and then go uh, uh, spread your rings elsewhere. Uh, like I said, New Japan, I think is going to be probably my favorite place for him to, to go. But like I said, time will tell and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. But the next thing we want to get to here, guys, is I kind of, you know, the main reason why we're here this weekend, uh, this show has uh, been kind of the, the buzz since it's kind of happened. Uh, we're talking to AEW revolution, but uh, before we kind of break down some of the, the main kind of stuff here, I'll start with you, Carl, just general impressions of the show overall. I'm going to run through a uh, quick little list of things here. So sure. um, AEW, your pay-per-views don't need to be so long. Mm. You have a two-hour show. That one. <laughs> you can do a two-and-a-half-hour program, and you're perfectly fine doing two-and-a-half hours because I feel as though I would have got my money's worth in two-and-a-half hours. Yep. Along with that now, a lot of these matches just went too long. <sighs> too long with a bunch of these matches uh, unfortunately and my third big thing from this and, and i'm not going to get to the huge thing that the whole world is a buzz about right now um the third thing stop with the thousand multiple time false finishes mm. Please, yes. we need to stop with false all of these classic. false finishes. I I love AEW. I really do. I'm a big fan of all elite wrestling. I have been since it started and came out. It's been something that has been a, um, a secondary program for me to watch as opposed to watching WWE or, or something from a little bit smaller like Ring of Honor or, or Impact Wrestling. It gives me the option to watch something else. But they need to kind of get away from this this uh, real hokey type of stuff, and especially with uh, all the false finishes and way too long matches. That's yeah. that's my quick little negative rant on <laughs> <laughs> that show last night. The show itself, don't get me wrong, was actually pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I, I I I I don't want to say that it was a bad show because it really wasn't. I was entertained for the most part. But I, there were times where I started uh, uh, feeling as though 
uh, I was slipping away from it because of those issues that I just spoke about. Yeah, for sure. For, for myself, before I hand it off to you, Ryan, uh, kind of a, kind of the same deal. Uh, the, the length. I mean, we we were just about ten minutes shy of being four hours. I mean, that's like WrestleMania uh, length. You know, we, we don't need to, to kind of go that long because honestly, I, I started to feel a little burnt out. Like, uh, just look at the, at the match run times. The you know, first match just under fifteen minutes. Next one, eighteen minutes. Uh, next one was actually the, the longest match of the night, almost just shy of thirty minutes. You know, fifteen minutes, fourteen minutes, twenty four minutes. 13 minutes, 25 minutes, like every match, it's just, it's like exhausting. The 30 you know? minute one though, you yeah. can't really fault that too much because well, that was like a, like a well, battle Royal, uh, Royal rumble for sure. like type of situation. So yeah, uh, that, that I, I can kind of understand. Um, one of my kind of main nitpicks, uh, believe it or not, was actually that, that tag team match. Uh, I guess just the, the way that they kind of shot that finish with the camera angle. I, I mean, for those who kind of pay attention, you know, that the Unbox, that, that Melter driver already looks kind of sketchy to begin with, but just the, the way that they shot that finish, it looked so bad. It looked so hokey and like, just, there's like no contact made whatsoever. Just it, for me, it, it kind of, uh, as somebody who really kind of looks at the, you know, the intricacies and all the moves in the match, that thing that like it really stood out to me, I was just like, hmm. I, I didn't think that that move really looked that bad before, but now it looks bad. Like it just, it looks hokey. Um, and then of course, I mean, we can get to what happened in the, uh, the main event, but we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get to that. I don't want to uh, jump the gun too much, but again, Again, you know, kind of overall impressions, um, good, but too long. I uh, would definitely agree on the length. What about you, Ryan? I thought it was a very good show. A um, lot of sloppy moments. Yeah. A lot of stuff that left you confused sometimes as a fan, which has become kind of the calling card for AEW now. They they yep. will do 90% great and 10% confusing, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. And, and again, I know... Uh, just like you guys, I got up this morning and I, I already knew from watching the show last night, social media would be cluing in on the finish yep. of the show. Yep. But throughout the body of it, I agree with you guys. I would love for them to do shorter shows. Give me give me more quality and less quantity is the best way I can put it. You know, like give, give me two and a half, two, two and a half hours of really good stuff and you can save all the hokey hor- horse crap <laughs> i'm catching myself there you can save all the extra all yeah. the all the ketchup and mustard you can leave it on the table yeah. just give me the meat and that that's kind of my whenever you know i just watched this show last night with my wife and once in a while i can talk her into sitting through a pay-per-view with me <laughs> and even at, at you know 8 30 9 o'clock we're looking at each other thinking when's this thing gonna get over yeah you know because we were ready to hey you know we're gonna probably go outside and sit on the porch and maybe, you know, make some food or something, you know, like you you don't want to, I hate to say it like this, but it's the same thing with a a full length feature film. You know, I love a great movie, but I don't always want to set through one that's three and a half hours long. Yep. And and that's kind of the way that I look at all of these pay-per-views, not just AEW. They're not the only ones guilty of it. It almost seems like they just try to overload the menu too many times. I gotcha. Yep, like you said, with uh, with movies, it's kind of the same way. Unless we're talking like The Godfather or something like that, I can sit through, you know, three hours of uh, The Godfather uh, with uh, no problems whatsoever. But to kind of get think, to, to, to uh, go ahead, Carl. I, I think another another little issue is that they started the pay per view at eight. Mm, yeah. Normally, most people are used to a pay per view starting at seven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. That's so true. seven to ten people people can generally do that, but when it starts getting past ten o'clock. Um, people start to to tune out a little bit more because now it's starting to get a little late and people have got to get up in the morning and they got to go to work and, you know, whatever uh, the situation might be. So starting it at 8 o'clock and running it for three and a half hours definitely would feel uh, too long and people will start to uh, lose interest and tune out. For sure. And I understand, and I'm sorry, Carl, I meant what I understand for the price point they're charging people, which is, I guess, normally forty nine ninety nine. For a pay per view, yep. they feel like they sh- they need to give people the bang for their buck. But even here in the central time zone, which was so the show started at seven here at, at eight thirty ten o'clock, we were looking at each other like you know we're ready to go, you know relax for the night. You know yep. this is too yeah. much. Yep. Yeah, Con- by ten o'clock. Yeah, I mean start oh. at seven, end at ten. Right. I don't Time. mind. And it's and it's almost become like and and I'll draw the analogy because I know we want to get into the show, but I'll draw the analogy to 
Super Bowl Sunday, you build up to that hype and you're all fired up and, hey, we're going to all sit down and watch the show and we're going to cook food and we're going to have friends over and everything else. And then you realize the pregame show was five hours long <laughs> and then the game is three hours long, you yeah, know, and yeah. then there's the postgame yeah. show. So it sometimes there's over e- even the best things have overkill. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. All right, well, let's break through. Uh, let's go. Sorry, go through some of the matches here uh, to kind of kick things off. Uh, the pre-show match was uh, actually uh, Doctor Britt Baker and Maki Ito uh, versus Riho and Thunder Rosa. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of almost wish maybe I could have seen this match. Um, <laughs> or I've actually tuned in for the pre-show because that, that one actually sounded a little bit interesting, especially uh, with the combination of uh, of Riho and Thunder Rosa. I think that might have been um, entertaining. Uh, I almost wish uh, I'm actually end up going back and watching that match uh, to see how it was because that, for a kickoff show uh, for a match sounds a little in- intriguing actually. It was. I I, I enjoyed it. Yep. I mean, it wasn't anything spectacular. Um, that's going to be a, th- a running theme, unfortunately. <laughs> but yep. it, it wasn't anything spectacular. But it was good. I, yep. I enjoyed it. Yeah, for sure. It was a nice precursor and ease in to yep. the actual pay per view. Yep. And, and that's what I love to see. I want to see a, a pre show match that's going to get me hyped and set up for the pay per view. And that that did it for me. That one delivered. Yep. And then I to- got one line on that, guys. The AEW women's division, despite the fact that it's been kind of sad when they first got started, it's getting better. It's getting better. better. Slowly but surely, they're getting better. Especially when you have like Serena Deeb and Thunder Rosa and that kind of, uh, you know, Ashita. Uh, You've got a good foundation there for a good thing. They just got to capitalize on it. Dr. Britt is a great character. She's not a great worker in the ring, but she's got a hell of a character. Yeah. No, I agree. It's definitely evolved. It definitely wasn't much when she started, but it it definitely is getting better. It's gone leaps and bounds from where it's been. uh, So uh, to actually kick off the show here, we had the the Young Bucks versus the Inner Circle, which in this case, uh, Chris Jericho and MJF. for me, this is kind of a, a reoccurring thing here. Whenever the Bucks open a show, it always bugs the hell out of me just because I know that they're going to do everything in that match. They got to get their shit in, and it just it's that <laughs> this was kind of no exception. Um, it, it's one of those things where you know, yeah, I know that they're the best tag team in the world, and they keep you know trying to rub that in our face. But it, it, I don't know about you guys, I'm almost kind of tired of seeing these guys. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest with you, the, the, seeing the young Bucks all the time now, it's like I'm a little burned out on those guys. What do you think, Carl? Uh, yeah, I'm starting to get to that point as well. I definitely am. Um, this, this matchup itself, I mean, I, I, I honestly love the pairing of Chris Jericho and yeah. uh, MJF. I really I like do. I, I think the two of them just works, work really good together. Uh, the, the, j- even just the, the banter back and forth between them really seems to just, uh, just kind of be spot on with, with building everything for the two of them as as a tag team and i enjoy that uh what i don't enjoy just kind of like you alluded to here the young bucks have to get absolutely everything in and they Mm. have to do uh, a thousand different super kicks within the matchup and they need to get beat up and 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 beat up up (laughs) only to (laughs) do a couple super kicks and win the matchup every single time yeah. And it's it's really starting to. I mean, it's it's predictable. It's yeah. it's one hundred percent predictable, and I'm tired of it. I, yeah. I definitely am. Um, and like I said at uh, the top of the show, that Meltzer driver, the way that they did it uh, on that night, it looked it looked bad. Uh, I wasn't a fan of it. Uh, what, did, what are your thoughts on this particular match, Ray? You know, it's kind of sad. The Young Bucks went from being very lovable to being kind of unwanted now by yeah. the fans. You know, yeah. when when they were doing the New Japan thing and Ring of Honor and and they were kind of cutting edge and traveling the world and, you know, they were being featured in Sports Illustrated and things like that. And it almost seems like now in AEW, you know, again, we talked about the length of pay-per-views. The Young Bucks are kind of the same way. Sometimes you get too much of a good thing. Yep. And the truth is, they are a very good tag team, but they almost seem like they've been exposed at this point. Yep. Yep. They, yes, and they, I think I they need to evolve. Um, you know, something needs to happen. You know, I think that's where having actually the one person that was in this match, Chris Jericho. I mean, who, who's been better at evolving and, and changing with the times than Chris Jericho in this business? Um, you guys 
pick his brain uh, and find out maybe you can evolve the character somehow just because you, know, you nailed it, Ryan. I mean, for the longest time, I mean, they were basically touring and hitting every independent promotion out there and they did get exposed. We saw too much of them and it gets extremely predictable because they do the same kind of shtick all the time. And I get it, you know they do they do it well, but when we see too much of it, it gets it gets, it gets boring. I'll just I'll just I'll just come out and say it. So, speaking of predictable, are we all in agreement that there's a big hint that MJF is going to take over the inner circle? And oh take yeah, care? yeah. Oh yeah. I think we got yeah. that last night. Absolutely, absolutely. Which I'm looking forward to. Actually, a Jericho face turn to me, I think would be great. For oh yeah. Him. For sure, uh, 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 to get kicked out of that, I mean, uh, that, that's where that storyline's going, and uh, that, that actually sounds somewhat interesting, albeit, uh, you know, again, it's one of those things that has been done before, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how it kind of goes. I'm sure Chris will uh, uh, do well with that. Uh, going from that to the uh, that casino uh, tag team battle royal, uh, this one was uh, a, a, a bit exhausting to kind of watch. Um, yes. <laughs> my my issue with this kind of match, I and mean, I like the personnel kind of involved, but there was one in particular that really stood out to me. I, I, again, I'm somebody who really kind of, almost to a fault, really looks at the minute kind of details. We got people during the match like standing around waiting for stuff to happen, and even the, the main one, we had Dustin Rhodes at these moments where it's like he's almost kind of like watching what's happening in the ring, and I'm left there going, Dustin, what are you doing? Don't stand there. Go do something. You know, just it's just it's stuff like that. Just it, it bugged the hell out of me. There, there's some cool moments in this match, but it just it was just like too many uh, moving parts. It just felt a little too chaotic for my liking. I mean, uh, I, I I like a, a good battle royal match. Don't get me wrong, but it it um, I don't know. It just it uh, felt a little strange to me. This one, the concept was great. I loved the idea of two tag teams, uh, you know, starting out and yep. then another tag team every ninety seconds. I liked that they actually had the timer on the screen to show that yes, it legitimately is ninety seconds and not a you know. 50 second WWE one that would happen. Um, so it, it, it added a little bit to that for me anyways, because I'm like, you know what? I actually see it's 90 seconds and I know it's going to be another tag team in 90 seconds. Yeah. Um, it, the whole concept of, you know, if one person gets thrown over, the other person can still win it for their team. I loved that idea as well. But you're right. There, It just seemed really chaotic. There seemed to be a lot going on. And then at times there seemed to be nothing going on. Yeah. And it really felt odd and out of place. Um, I can't even remember who they were saying. Um, one of you guys might remember. But someone had from the back came down and started beating on, on somebody else or eliminated yeah. somebody. From I lost track. Th- <laughs> the the matchup yeah. um, out of like just nowhere and the commentators I didn't even see it happen. Yeah. But the commentators made mention of it, strange. which then had me going, wait a second, what what? Why? Yeah. He, mm. This person wasn't even yep. in the matchup. Um, that mind mind boggle. Like why yeah. why? Yeah. Why? It didn't need to happen. You had hit on something there, Carl, but before I hand it off to you, Ryan, just a brief mention. Um, people might feel differently than me on this. Um, I think they should have given JR the night off. You know, nothing against JR. I love JR. But, I mean, going into it, you could tell, like, his voice, uh, that there was something wrong. They, they should have given him the night off and let Shivani and Excalibur and, uh, you know, uh, and maybe even have thrown Callus in there for the, the maybe the whole show. But, uh, Paul, but White. Paul White. Yeah, the or Paul White. Paul White. Yeah, but Paul I agree, Joe. Been yeah. I don't. I just real quick, a couple things on that. I didn't mean to. Again, I always bust bust them. <laughs> no worries. But because when you guys throw something at me that I find intriguing, I have to reply. But nope, that's a good number thing. one. The the one guy, the one guy that I I think really stood out in this match was Jungle Boy, and I thought mm. he was going to take it for his yeah. team. I thought they were going to really put him over that way. Yeah. But Joe having said that, and it was something I hadn't thought about. But even as the show started. As we were watching it, I turned to my wife and said, "JR sounds bad." Like, yeah. and, and I mean, when you're a fan of someone and you've watched them all those years, you'd rather yeah. them not be there and struggle through the show yep. because there were times when you could tell he was just efforting oh, yeah. to get through a couple of sentences, yeah. and he just sounded bad. And you know, you hate to see somebody out there that is basically, if he's not the best in the business, he's one of the top one or two. You know, him yeah. and Gordon probably Gordon Soley, uh, yeah. but. 
listening to that last night, it was brutal listening him to try to get through the show. And so, mm. you know, again, as somebody that really respects Jim Ross and, and thinks the world of him, I agree with you, Joe. He, he should have taken the night off last night. Yeah. And strangely enough, though, he seemed to have gotten better in the last couple matches. His voice almost seemed to kind of clear up a little bit, but for that first three quarters or so, like I, I was sitting there going, just feeling bad for him. Like he was just like like you had mentioned, Riley, he was just kind of like willing himself uh, through the show, and uh, uh, got to give him some respect. But they should have uh, during rehearsals and stuff like that. I've kind of picked up on that and be like, hey, you know what, dude, just like Absolutely. just you know, t- take the night off, and we got we got you covered. Right. Sometimes you shouldn't play hurt. Yes. While it's yes. admirable, yeah. sometimes it's better to take care of yourself than to take care of business. Bingo. Nailed and it. And I think that you had you had even said it when Joe mentioned uh, you know, a different name. I I think you and I both said Paul White. Yeah. <laughs> this would have been the perfect opportunity to him. have Paul come out. Yep. And then now you've got this new dark show that you're gonna be doing. Let the people hear Paul White on the microphone or on commentary to build up and have people go. I loved what he said. I loved how he commentated. I want to go and watch this show because he's commentating on it now. Boom. I think, I think it would have like, been great if in the middle of the show, Jim Ross literally tagged in Paul White. Yeah. <laughs> right. That would, yeah. that would have been cool. That would have been cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just br- briefly, uh, just a quick thing on uh, this match before we move on to the next one. Th- this um, tag team battle royal casino type match, for for me, you guys may or may not agree. This should have been the pre show match. I think, I think it would have been. Agree. I think it would have yeah. been better place to to have been that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, next up we had for the AEW Women's uh, World Championship, we had uh, Hikaru Shida versus Ryo Mizunami. I think I got her name right. Uh, this was kind of a, a bit of an odd one. Uh, for for me, the I guess the, my biggest takeaway from it, um, nothing against uh, Rio or Ryo Mizunami. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her first name correctly. Her character and her style doesn't necessarily translate that well over to the to North America. I mean, in Japan, that kind of stuff works fantastic. Stardom, all those promotions over there. I mean, that's kind of a, right in their wheelhouse. Now, she does being able to kind of evolve and kind of endear herself to the, the North American audience, you know, the, the cosplay element and all that kind of stuff. And she's just, she's good in the ring and she's very, very easy in the eyes, by the way. And, uh, but Mizunami just went one of those things where she was trying to do like those chops in the corner and it just, it, it's like she, like, I don't know if she was trying to imitate somebody or what it was. It just, it, it felt really odd. Her, just her, her presence, her whole character and everything just didn't really fit. Uh, for me, I, I know that she's a very talented uh, wrestler and uh, and does very well, but just it, it felt I don't know, just it, it felt like she was forcing it out there. But uh, um, Sheeta always uh, entertained to watch, but just the other half didn't do much for me. And, and I'm, I'm 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 a person who's a fan of Japanese women's wrestling, and, and it kind of turned me off a little bit. So my biggest thing is why. I mean, I, I totally get and understand, okay, they've had history, 10-year history or yeah. whatever, right? But you have so much women's talent on the roster, yeah. and you did this whole tournament to have another Japanese worker now come over to have a match for the women's championship? Yeah. Well, she won the tournament. If, yeah. yeah, That's that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. She, so why was there even this tournament for, yeah. for someone to win when AEW has claimed this entire time that everything goes by wins and losses? So whoever had the most wins going into this pay-per-view, according to their standard, yeah. should have been the number one contender and got that title shot. Someone who is on the roster and you're seeing absolutely every week. Yeah. Instead, we have this tournament and you bring another Japanese star here to have a match with your Japanese champion in mm-hmm. North America. I have nothing against the Japanese and Japanese wrestling, but when you have a talent pool already, why are you pulling in more and giving them a title shot? Yeah. That's that. That's the thing that blew my mind. Yeah. The match wasn't bad. I mean, uh, I'll give it that. It definitely wasn't. But a lot of it, like you said, Joe, didn't translate to no. the North American uh, standard and North American fans. So, yep. yeah, I mean, that's yeah. I don't know. You got you got talent. Use them. 
Oh yeah, and in that tournament too, they they had a fair amount of uh, uh, Japan personnel in there. Of course, you know we had Riho, um, uh, Yuka, and um, Emi Sakura, uh, a big uh, Japanese legend actually in women's professional wrestling over there. Uh, Ido, uh, Mi- uh, Mizunami, uh, Aja Kong. I mean. Almost half of the, the kind of the tournament were these uh, Japanese wrestlers that they brought in, and I get it. You know, Kenny's booking that women's division, and he has a, you know, he has a hard on for the the Japanese women wrestlers. I totally get it. You know, same I do too. I enjoy women's uh, Japanese professional wrestling, but it, it's that women's division that gets gotten bloated, and they need to be careful because they have some really good standout talent. But we just have to be careful that we're not picking the wrong people. Uh, you know, I would have done like Thunder Rosa or something like that, you know, I would have you know, sent her through the, the tournament instead of having her in a pre-show match, but hey, that's just my opinion. <laughs> so Ryan, what do you think on the, on that matchup? As much as I really do love Hikaru Shida, I think she's a, a, a wonderful talent and I love her matches. This was a smoke break for us. Yeah. I'll just put it that way. We okay. stepped yeah. outside during, got back in to see the finish, which I thought the finish of the match was fabulous. But I honestly, yep. I paid almost little to no attention to this match. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, Joe. Can you you can can you pronounce the challenger's name for me one more time? Uh, Ryu Mizunami. No, that's wrong. And the reason you don't know her name is because none of us do. <laughs> ah. and that, that's why right. this was a smoke break match for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could have seen had it been Aja Kong or yeah. Riho or somebody like that. And the reason, and and I'm I'm just kidding with you because honestly, I didn't know the girl's name. No, going into the match, you know. No. So, uh, while I understand that these these ladies are big stars in Japan, they're not big stars in America. Yep. And to have them in the middle of a card this important, yep. I thought, you know, this this might have been an opening match for yep. a pay per view, or a, a dark match for a pay per view, or maybe a, a match you don't even put on pay per view. You know, and that's sure. just the way that I saw it. Again, nothing against these ladies because they're all great performers, and I understand that they have a great audience overseas but they don't have that same appeal here in America. I, I think AEW would be well served while, while Sheeta is a, an incredible performer. And mm-hmm. I think Riho, she just had that great match with Serena Deeb. Yeah. They need to focus just like what you said on AEW homegrown talent, yeah. not Yoshi talent. That's overseas. I agree. 100%. So next up are these next two matches here. Uh, were ones that were almost kind of like these filler matches for me. I mean, th- they were okay, but they weren't really, I think, spectacular. You know, we had uh, Miro and Kip Sabian versus the best friends, and then Paige and Matt Hardy. Um, I mean, good, solid matches, but for me, just uh, one of those ones where I'm just watching, and it's like, okay, you know, good for what they are, but didn't really kind of move anything forward for myself. Nothing standing, no- you know, nothing that I'll be, you know, looking back fondly in 10 plus years from now. They're, they were just there and they were, they were, I don't know if you guys would agree with that or not, or on that or not. I, I agree with yeah. that fully. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I enjoyed watching, uh, you know, Hangman and Matt. Yeah, uh, good Hardy. match. But that just, was a good matchup. Yeah. I enjoyed it, but uh, nothing memorable coming out of it. I mean, that was uh, that was it. I mean, the most memorable thing coming out of it, it was after the matchup when uh, Matt Hardy kind of uh, called his wife or, or something like that and is like, don't worry, honey, we'll, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get through this. Uh, yeah. I know I lost, uh, you know, my first quarter paychecks, but don't yeah. worry, we, we, we can get through this. And... Uh, Okay, cool. <laughs> You're yeah. sticking with storyline. I get it. That's yeah. awesome. But uh, I mean, yeah, like that's that's what I remember the most coming out of that matchup. Yeah. Um, you know, Matt Hardy lost, called up uh, uh, his wife Rebby, and yeah. is like, "Oh, don't worry, we'll we'll get through this. Yeah. It's all it's going to be okay." Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That's. Yeah. <laughs> I caution AEW. Uh, if you're going to use Ruby at all, be very, very careful because it's very well known that she uh, doesn't have a filter and she speaks her mind. Um, yeah. So uh, try carefully if you're going to use her storyline wise, please. <laughs> just to just, Ryan, what about yeah. you for uh, for those two matches? Well, I was happy to see Hangman. I'm a big Hangman Adam Page fan, yep. so I mean, and I and I think he's one of those guys that I don't know what happened. You know, just yeah. a year or so ago, I thought he was going to be an AEW World Champion. Now he's yeah. kind of more in the middle of the card and all that stuff. Yep. But as far as Matt Hardy's concerned, I miss Broken Matt. Mm-hmm. I don't like Big Money Matt. No. I like yeah. Broken Matt Hardy. Like broken Matt and Hardy I'm too. hoping that this whole I lost all my money angle 
is leading to him being broken maybe, once again. Maybe, but maybe, but yeah. Joe, I will agree with what you said. Some of these matches here in the middle of the card, it just seemed like blush. You know, it just yep. it just seemed like an appetizer to the rest of the show. Uh, even this match, and again with two guys I really like, I just it didn't you know blow my hair back. I'll put no. it that way. Yep. So next up, we had the uh, they were calling Face of the Revolution ladder match uh, for a future shot at the AEW TNT Championship match, which uh, involved Scorpio Sky, Cody Rhodes, Pentagon, Lance Archer, Max Caster, and a debuting Ethan Page. Now, I have no issue with the actual match itself. Right, the, the, the match was fine for me. My issue, my big takeaway from this match, as usual was that thing hanging above the ring. This company just cannot avoid taking shots at WWE when they can. That friggin' brass ring hanging above the, the ring, they, they, these guys, they just can't help themselves. They have to get a shot in there. That For me, that, that it almost kind of overshadowed the match itself, honestly. The fact that, that a literal brass ring hanging above the ring, I mean, okay, guys, but, I mean, just, again, you're... you're you're still poking and prodding, and I keep cautioning them to not do that, and they keep doing it. So it is where it is. I, I like the match itself, but just that, that thing hanging above the ring almost kind of ruined it for me. Somebody <laughs> online called it a golden hemorrhoid pillow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I was happy with the matchup, to be honest. Yeah. And, and honestly, to see all ego come out, I was like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah. I was I was honestly happy with that, and then I'm 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 watching social media as well as the pay per view is going on, and people are like, "This better not be that big announcement." Oh, who's this guy? Blah blah blah. Yeah. Shut up, people! If you don't See, know who this person is, go and watch some professional yeah. wrestling. Yeah. Get your head out of the WWE's ass and watch some <laughs> professional wrestling. Yeah. Because if you did, you would know who All Ego yeah. is. That's yeah. <laughs> you would know. Yeah. You definitely would. And did he not look like a million bucks? Oh, I mean, he looked good. Yeah. He, he looked Matt good. Ethan, yeah. He, I mean, let's be honest. He had a little, still had a little baby fat a few oh, years. Yeah. Yeah. And now he's ripped. I oh, mean, yeah. to the yeah. kill. And I actually messaged him this morning because I've interviewed Ethan a couple times. Great. First of all, he's a great person, so he's easy oh, yeah. to root for. And just told him, man, dude, you look like – I hate to use yeah. it, if you have yeah. to edit this, a brick shit house. Yeah, I mean, because he no. does. He looks like he's in the best shape yeah. of his life right now, yeah. and yeah. he's a guy with his talent and charisma. He's not only talented in the ring, and he can work a lot of different styles. But the greatest thing he has is this. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's what's going to make him a star for AEW. I I was totally happy to see him pop up. Mm. And again, it's not just based on personal experiences that I've had with him, but also just the fact that. You know, I've watched this guy, and, and, you know, anytime you see a young guy that just seems to be climbing those different rungs in the ladder, and then they, they get that big pop, they get that big debut, I, I was that was, to me, the highlight, personally, of okay. that match. And and for for us, kind of, in, you know, in that pro wrestling bubble, uh, you know, especially because, you know, we, you know, venture outside of WWE, I appreciate it. I, know I, I like the debut. Now, putting myself in the shoes of somebody, like you had just mentioned, Carl, somebody who's just a WWE viewer or somebody that's a new viewer or somebody that's a casual viewer, I totally understand them going, who? And that better not be the big debut. I, I, I get that that mindset from, from that person who's not us, right? So uh, I like the debut, but I could see some people going, and going, oh, okay. okay. You know, I mean, it was good, but I just, I don't know who he is. I mean, uh, th that definitely must have had that reaction outside of people like us, right? So, oh, it, it you, definitely did. Yeah, uh, isn't Ethan from you guys' backyard anyway? Isn't I believe he from so. Ontario. I, be I'm, I'm pretty, well, I, believe I know he's so. Canadian, but I, I think yeah. that he's from up around. I, be that I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The southern, southern Ontario yeah. area. Yeah. I believe so that's an right. extra reason to root for him, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've never had the opportunity to meet him. I've never had the opportunity to to talk with him, interview, nothing like that. I just have seen his body of work over the years, and I, I've i been a fan of his work, and that's why I popped so hard to mm. see All Ego, and I love that, 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 that name, All Ego, Ethan Page. I freaking love it because yeah. he, he, he can back it up, and especially, like you said, Ryan, on the mic, he can back it up. So for those of, uh, of you who don't 
at, know or have not heard anything from him. So all these people that keep on saying MJF is so good on the mic, MJF is is great on the mic. Okay, so now MJF has a running contender in Ethan Page because I can guarantee you he can keep up with the best of them on that microphone. Um, 100% oh, oh I put it Carl, out there. Carl, imagine a, a feud between MJF and Ethan Page. That'd be interesting, right? Almost yeah. that would go back yeah. and forth. Yeah. That oh would be my great. god, that would be awesome. And uh, yeah. and and just looking it up while, while you guys were talking, I did uh, look up his profile here, and uh, he actually is from Stony Creek, Ontario. I've actually lived in Stony Creek and worked in that in Stony Creek. So, yeah, uh, you know, he, that's not really not too far. He's actually done some stuff here in Brantford as well, where I'm located. So, um, yeah, pretty cool. So, yeah, now, like I said, I had no issue with the match itself. My Real issue was just with that prop hanging above the ring. That that kind of rubbed yeah. me the wrong way as these jazz, little jabs that they do all the time kind of bug me. Even with the um, – just briefly on uh, on Paul White too because uh, it came out too, you know, that, that I guess Vince contacted him. Um, it was like the first one that said, you know, oh, I see that you're doing this and good luck and all that kind of stuff. And and him saying – and Paul saying, oh, there's no bad blood. But, but they, then again, you come out with a shirt that says no BS on it. It's like – Okay, you know, things are fine, but yet we still got to take that shot, right? It's, uh, you know, I don't know. I just, it's, it's one thing that, that bugs me about this company consistently is that they, they need to, to take a shot at the other company. That, that, that's something I, I think I, we I need to do with out that. One other joke that came out of that match was I, I think that when they had the thing hanging up above the ring, yeah. the, the, the brass ring that they had hanging up, I made the joke to my wife that, that thing looks like it's the size of a whale's asshole. Yeah. <laughs> that is like, a fair why comparison. That big? Well, no, I mean like it was. It was like a, a, a thing, life preserver. Oh, oh, yeah. there, you know? like, that's well, funny. Yeah, that's terrible. Like I'd, it was. It was probably <laughs> one of the worst props I've yeah. ever seen in pro wrestling. That was a good one. I didn't even think of that. Um, and but I guess it was. I believe before this next match where we saw the big. Debut the big signee the 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 the, the big intro, um, Kristen Cage. I mean, I, I I like like the signing. I think a lot of us kind of predicted it. I thought the segment itself was was very underwhelming though. Like it just it's like you didn't even have the guy talk. Like it was he just came in to the music. It sounded very TNA ish. By the way, his theme yes, uh, from uh, from Impact. But I mean, you didn't even get the the man a microphone. Uh, I I I, I like the debut, but I just I felt so underwhelmed by it. I was just like, I saw. I, I think a lot of us saw it coming to this, so that didn't help. But just the segment itself, just like uh, like it's like the bottom just kind of fell out of it. I, I felt uh, almost sad, kind of coming out of it. I don't know, Carl. Who did you think it was going to be? I thought it was going to be Kurt Angle. Honestly, I well because of all all the stuff that uh, Angle had been uh, tweeting out and yeah. stuff, you know, I I, I kind of thought the same thing there. Um, but then I started going, well, may, maybe it's Hulk Hogan, um, you know, to get that, oh, uh, that no. next huge <laughs> wow. name. Oh Jesus! Right? Oh. I, I, Thank I God could, it was Christian. Yes, <laughs> yes, I definitely could see could have seen Hulk Hogan though. So I was like, yeah. No. My God. Uh, but then when when that music hit. It was so familiar yeah. from his impact days that I'm like, oh my god, it's Christian. Oh my god, it's yeah. Christian. Oh my god, <gasps> it's Christian. Yeah. And I, I popped for it. I definitely did. I was, I was super happy with it. Um, you're right. Underwhelming for the segment, though. One hundred percent. Another missed opportunity where they could have had Paul White come out because, well, isn't he the one that right. said there's going to be this big, uh, you know, mm. future Hall of Fame name signed with? AEW, they should have had him come out and and at least you know uh, introduce instead of having uh, uh, Josh Ma- or yeah. having um, the Yapper Dapper do it right and uh, have Paul White come out and do it and 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 have, then have Christian come out and have them handshake or have them hug or something right to to make it a little bit bigger especially for a name like Christian Cage. I mean, yeah. I think he deserved a little bit more, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was almost kind of thinking, maybe it was just because I was thinking of our upcoming Turnbuckle Rewind match, that I was like, could it maybe be Ric Flair? Like, uh-huh. is that, and maybe his test is kind of up in the air. Uh, I would definitely friggin' hope not, Hulk Hogan. I mean, otherwise we're really doing the WCW <laughs> angle now. But uh, right. just, uh, but yeah, I mean, Christian, uh, I mean, I'll just say it. I mean, the on-the-nose pick, right? Um, I have no idea what happened with him in WWE. I mean, I thought he was all 
kind of set up to have a bit of a run there, and I have no idea what happened there. Um, I have no clue. I don't know if you do. You have any information on that, Ryan? Uh, the, like possibly what kind of what happened there? Because I mean, it's like he was there. They were set to do a big kind of thing, and then just whoo, goodbye. Am I the only one that thinks that Christian's just sort of been screwed by WWE, like for most of his career? Yeah. Like that's how he ended up in TNA a few years ago. Yeah. And- then they kind of put him on the shelf for a while. <laughs> I just, I just kind of feel like he's one of those guys that's always been underappreciated yep. by the folks up there in Stanford. So, you know, I mean, if his contract was up and he had the chance to make the jump, you know, I, it's not nearly the same as it was, you know, 15 years ago when no. he made the jump to TNA. Cause that was a, a major story at the time, you know, yeah. that was oh, kind yes. of the first big WWE star who made that move. But, you know, the one thing that I, I hate is when people always compare, they say this, well, AEW signed in former WWE guys, and it's, and now they're TNA 2.0. Well, yeah. you know what? I hate to break it to everybody, but TNA, now called Impact, <laughs> they've been around 20 years. Yeah. So they must be doing something right. I mean, whether you <laughs> necessarily love their product or some of the tactics they've tried, they're still in business right now, yep. and a lot of wrestling companies can't say that. That's very, very true. So, you know, I mean, if AEW, yes, do I, I really necessarily think it's a great idea to sign a bunch of aging guys that, unless they're there to put over young talent, they almost serve no purpose, quite frankly. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean that. Like, guys like Paul White, if, if he can get on the microphone and put over the next big man, you know, maybe even have a match with Lance Archer or somebody like that or Wardlow, whoever is the guy they choose, then that's fine. I have no problem with them signing guys who are in their 40s and 50s as long as you use them right. But at the same time, you know, to say, oh, they're just going out to sign everybody that used to work for WWE, I don't agree with that. I think if there's a strategy there, it works. If there's no strategy and it's just, hey, let's hand everybody a check, well, then you're going to go the same route WCW did. Yeah. Yeah. So next up, we had uh, the big street fight with uh, Darby Allen and Sting versus uh, Team Taz, which was uh, Brian Cage and Ricky Starks. This was a, an odd one for me because uh, they, they went with this cinematic approach. And I guess maybe it was, cause it was getting to the point of the night where it's like, okay, I just want to get to the main event and I want to kind of get out of here. So it, it's not yeah. so much that I slept on this match. It's that I was just eager to kind of get through it. And uh, I mean... These cinematic matches, I've I have never really been that fond of necessarily, but I just kind of wanted to like just get to the next match. That's how I felt about it. I was super happy with this matchup, yeah. to be honest with you. I loved the cinematic way that everything was done, that everything was shot. I loved the the lights in the back shining through with kind of silhouette-ish type of, yeah. like all of the cinematography of it was oh, yeah. done pretty damn well. Um, and it gave us more sting. Yeah. So this is something that they could have done over a period of a week's time and yeah. got, you know, through everything and given sting more opportunity to do work in the, uh, ring yeah. quote unquote ring, because I mean, it was a street fight. It happened all over this abandoned warehouse uh, yeah. type of situation. Um, so th- for that, I loved it because yeah. I got to see Sting do yeah. more than we would have seen if it had been at Daly's place. Yeah. Sting would have been in there, done a couple Stinger splashes, and then done a Scorpion Death drop, uh, Scorpion Death lock, and then that probably would have been about it, right? Yeah. So for me, I was very much so happy with yeah. it, and I very get the, much so. And I get the approach to, you know, with Sting, you know, they want, they want to kind of protect him too. So I think you know, going the cinematic approach, the right move. Uh, again, for me, just, you know, like we had hinted at earlier in the show here that you know, this was a long show and I was just yeah. getting to the point, it's like, okay, I just want to get to this main event and I want to kind of get out of here. That's, it just, and unfortunately this match is just a casualty. It's, uh, I'm, I'm sure like if I look back on it and just kind of just watch it by itself, probably a great match, but just, I was kind of getting a little burned out on the show at this point. I do have to say that coffin drop. I loved it. Oof. That coffin that move, drop spot, no, I sweet. loved it. That move no. scares the hell out of me every time he does it. It's just, man. Guys, Ryan, what, what are your right, thoughts on that? I, I, all I would say about it is, you know, I, I love seeing Sting back in action, and and I, I'm a huge fan of Darby Allen. I love Brian Cage. He's a cool dude. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> every, you know, everybody involved in the match I'm a big fan of, but am I the only one that's kind of like now at this point, okay, we've seen these movie matinee-style matches 
that you're just sort of like, okay, we've seen it now. I'm done. You know, some of it, and and don't get me wrong. And Carl, I'll agree completely with what you said. The way it was shot was wonderful. They did a wonderful job with it. I love seeing all these guys together, but at the same time, some of the, some of the movie style matches now at this point, I've, I'm, I'm just kind of through with them. Yeah. I was the same way when, when I saw that they had started with it. I definitely was because uh, we've seen AEW do this a lot. We've seen WWE has really started to do this as well, you know, with like the AJ Undertaker match that happened. That was all cinematography done, right? But this one, I don't know. For, for whatever reason, this one for me just kind of felt different and I kind of enjoyed this one more. And I went into it going, great, another cinematography style matchup. Okay, all right. But then as it as the match happened and started to progress and, and I really started to go, hey, that's different than what they've normally done. Hey, that's, oh, that was cool. Oh, I love how they shot that scene. And, you know, so I was able to really get more involved because of how different it was from all the other ones that were done but you're right it's it, there's a lot of them that are that are happening and you know most of the time it's kind of eh, okay great and and you know as much as i i have always been loyal to the folks that i know to impact and everything else they've done some really silly crap oh yeah in terms of mm. the cinematic stuff so i think at some point you get <laughs> wrestle house yeah <laughs> karate man and murdering people yeah. in the story right. is, is another part of it that maybe I wouldn't do, you know, but yeah. at the same right. time, you know, I, I understand the necessity to do it right now, but I just think again, and I go back to that same thing that you and I just said earlier, Joe, less is more, mm-hmm. you know, more quality, mm-hmm. less quantity, Absolutely. you know, and, and that's just the way I see it. And some of this stuff. And then I also realized that sting can't really get in the ring and work a, you know, he's not going to get in there and work a 20 minute match no, anymore because he he's not physically not. capable to. And that's that, those are the limitations he has at 61 years old. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. No. But, you know, I don't know. The movie matches to me, I, I, I could take a break from them. You know, yeah. I pass the popcorn to somebody else because I don't really want to watch. <laughs> yeah. But I will agree with what Carl said. The, the, the spot when Darby, you know, did the coffin drop was sweet. I have to admit, I popped that hard for that. Yeah, that was yeah. something. All right, time to address the elephant in the room, the the match that has the um, internet wrestling community buzzing like crazy. Um, you know, let, let's just kind of uh, address that and wrap the, the hop here. That the, the finish to this match has got to be like one of the more polarizing things that I've seen in quite a while. Um I mean, I've heard people say that, you know, this ranks up there like blunder-wise, like great right with shot, like Shockmaster. And it's it's hard to disagree with that. I mean, just it's given everything like just the way that this was kind of set up, and even I guess they kind of even consulted like the, the person, the innovator of this match, and then to finish off, like really, we set off sparklers and a couple of really very mute explosions, and then we have Eddie Kingston. And don't get me wrong, I love Eddie Kingston. But man, he like oversold the, the, the hell of that. And I get it, that's just Eddie being the, the professional. He didn't necessarily expect it to kind of go that way. And he wanted to kind of really sell the moment. But just, man, it, it, it was like I said to Carl before we started recording, it was like having like a really great bowl of ice cream and then getting to the end of it. And there was like a big pile of crap in the bottle of the, of the bowl. That's how that's how I kind of felt about this. I, you know, the match was great, but the ending just like, ah, oh, ah, oh, like, damn it, guys. You, you had something really great and then you like missed it. Oh, that's I, that's I what I felt. Much more filthy analogy for it. Yeah, I, maybe. I, okay, I will put it to you like this. I okay. love the match. Don't me I love the match itself. I, the whole but match is great. But Joe, that ending, like, end, god damn it! Like, like yeah. Oh. And uh, here's the way I would put it. And Carl, I'll throw this at to you after I'm done. But it's almost like you meet this really good looking girl, <laughs> and she's beautiful oh, and adorable, no. and she's sweet and nice, and you guys have so much in common, and you date for a while, and then finally, when that night of magic happens, you find out she's a dead lay. Yeah, and and, and it ruins everything. Yep. She could be the greatest girl in the world, but the one thing you're going to remember about her is that she sucks in bed. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that's truthfully, I mean, that was the way that I looked at that match. And and really, yeah. that whole show, it was like you you kind of just dry humped us <laughs> and then left us hanging it's, at the end. And that comparison. was 
that was a, I mean, as much as I, I love AEW, I love the people that were involved in that match. I thought, I thought Kenny and Mox just tore it down. Oh, yeah. And then to have it go out like that with a whimper, it was just, I, like I said, I felt like I got dry humped. Yep. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> what, are your, what are your thoughts on this, Carl? So I don't know if that is the actual way that that was supposed to end. Or hmm. was this something that went wrong? Okay. So if this is something that went wrong, then God damn it, people. Yeah. It's live television. Mistakes happen. We can't just call cut and reset and go and try this again. No. It's live, it's live pal. television. Yep. And I believe that that is not the way that it was supposed to happen oh, clearly, because yeah. of the way that Eddie sold it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Eddie sold it like it was supposed to be the real explosion and thing that happened. Yep. And I can, I, I almost feel as though that we were supposed to get, yes, yeah, stuff coming like the, the sparklers that came out. It's definitely that was supposed to happen. And then explosions around and everything was ex- supposed to explode around all three of those uh, different pods on the outside, which would have made a bigger explosion with more smoke. And then I guarantee we were probably supposed to see the ring collapse, Not which even. would give yep. yeah. more legitimacy to what... Yep, that would Eddie saved it. was doing. So we had a fail in construction and design. Yeah. Come on, people. Yeah. If that's what you're going to focus on throughout this hey. entire show that they gave you, there's something wrong with you and you need <laughs> to change your way of freaking thinking. I understand that even Vince McMahon himself has said, People will remember the ending. I get that 100%. But if you people continue to think that way and continue to allow Vincent Kennedy McMahon to dictate your thoughts and feelings towards the end is everything, then you're the problem. Check yourself. Think for yourself and make a better determination and think maybe something went wrong. Now, I do have to say that I absolutely am a fan of the way that they have tried to correct it, mm. uh, whether it was a fan or whether it was however it, w- it happened, but there is video that's out there. And if you go and take a look at our Facebook page Sorry. at TB Talk Pod or our Instagram page at TB Talk Pod. You will see that video where John Moxley essentially says Kenny Omega is this big cleaner, but he ain't no construction man because that was shit. Yeah. Right. And I, well, why in the hell would Kenny be putting the ring together anyway? Yeah, that's I mean, Tony Khan's worth six billion dollars yeah. or whatever. Hire a crew. Who does that sort of thing? Yeah. You know what? Hire a crew who knows how to set off dynamite. Right. Yes. You know. I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, why? Why would it be up to the wrestlers to come up with that? That was such well, a because it was, it was just story, it was such a storyline going uh, through saying, you yeah. know, like Moxley had the matchup that he wanted. Now Omega is making this matchup, which is going to be so diabolical, and he's constructing it with the help of Don Callis, and like that was just all the story that yeah. was that was happening behind it, and unfortunately uh you gotta kind of have to continue with that story now afterwards especially after such a such a botch and don was trying so hard to sell it during the entire match too like just like (laughs) really pushing that pushing that and i get it that's the narrative yeah everybody was trying to still sell it after it botched that was the crazy thing oh my god yeah (laughs) they went dark (laughs) like the poor announcers were still trying to be like oh can you believe how bad these guys are getting burned? <laughs> no, we can't. Because they, they've got 4th of July sparklers going off on every turn. Yeah. You, know what, you know what they needed, Carl? You know what they needed? More nitro. Yes. yes. More nitro. There you go. <laughs> it came wow. in. I didn't think I was going to have props today, but I came prepared. Yep. <laughs> so there we go. That's that. That's uh, AEW Revolution 2021. And um, it, like I said, uh, you kind of nailed it there, Carl. But unfortunately, 
the majority of people out there, when they think back on this event, that's going to be what they think of. I mean, that's that just a harsh reality that uh, the great matches will go unrecognized and they'll, they'll just think the lame finish, John Moxley dying via sparklers. That's what people yep. are going to think. Yeah. Most, most people will remember the time they got fired from a job more than the time they got hired. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. yeah. It's always yeah. that disappointing finish to things that always leaves the bad taste in your mouth for one sure. way. And unfortunately this again, and, and I just to wrap it up on my side of things, I thought this was a, a tremendous pay-per-view until those last few minutes. Yeah. And they killed it in those last few minutes. They destroyed it in those last few minutes. Unfortunately, they didn't destroy the ring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just because we are running a little bit long, I just want to hit on uh, this last topic before. Uh, I think we'll kind of skip our breaking news because, you know, we, we did cover a lot on uh, on the show already. But uh, just a, a quick hit here. Um, essentially, WWE saying that they're going to basically fine you for doing thigh slaps. Now, strangely enough, probably Carl, especially you're, you're probably expecting me to react a certain way on this, but I'm actually okay with this, uh, with the, the banning of thigh slaps. And you know, this stems largely from the conversation that myself, Ryan, Rick, Jargo, and everybody, when we talked to Mr. Tom Pritchard, because he actually, um, kind of hinted at this, that it has become very much overused. And the, the, the fact that not everything, sounds like a punch to the face or a kick or a drop kick to the face doesn't sound like a like a slap so you know what i'm actually okay with this because a drop kick shouldn't sound like that when you kick something in the face it doesn't sound like a slap it just it just doesn't and it's something that that has kind of bugged me for a little while so you know what I'd actually like to see this even become something not just wwe that the fact that you know i think that if you're going to actually slap somebody, make it sound like a slap. But I mean, it, it's something that has honestly become very much overused. I'll, I'll throw this over to you, Ryan. And, and what are your thoughts on this? And then over to Carl after that. I'd actually probably because he's a trained worker, I'd, I'd th- more than likely throw it over to Carl. Sure, but, yeah. you know, Carl. I, I think KW. You you know, back in the day, probably when you got trained, guys didn't do that, but they would make that sound with their mouth. That yeah. <laughs> Sound when they were throwing punches, so yep. it would accentuate the sound, or and, and maybe slap like you know Bobby Eaton or some of the guys or Arn Anderson could throw punches and kind of slap their own arm as they were throwing them, yep. but it wasn't over the top and exaggerated. The leg slap thing has gotten to the point where yep. it's it's almost ridiculous now. Yeah, it's like and, all the time, yep. right? Yeah, and and I think don't don't you think old school or I don't, I don't I hate using that term old school, <laughs> but you know the traditional wrestling way is that you're trying to hide how much you're accentuating the moves you're doing. And now the guys are just the leg slap thing. It's like so obvious. I'm kind of with Joe. I'm in agreement for one of the few times I'm in agreement with WWE (laughs) is that I think I would just let the leg slap thing go. And, and the question I have, and and I'll, I'll throw out my opinion then I'll leave it out to you guys is how hard is it going to be for some of these kids that have trained for 10 years in wrestling and every match they're slapping their leg. How hard is it going to be for them to break that habit? Yeah. Very it's difficult. It's going to be very hard. Yep. Very difficult. Yep. Cause when you train, you train a certain way and that's, that's in embedded into your brain and that's what you remember. Yep. Right. So, yeah. I mean, for them, it's going to be super hard. I know I, I'll speak from just my experience here super quick because uh, Joe said he wants to forego the breaking news, but I want to actually want to hit just two quick, sure. very, very quick little things for that. But um, when, when, when we would throw a slap, we would cup our hand so that it, you, it would make that sound when actually hitting. So the sound would be accentuated when you, when you cupped your hand, uh, throwing a punch little bit of a different story, right? We uh, the the fist is is not clenched, but it's open a little bit. So when we threw a punch, we would kind of as we're coming around, we we would just kind of bring our hand up, make it look like we're trying to put more more force into it, and we would just kind of hit our sh- our shoulder or something a little bit just to kind of mm-hmm. get that little bit of an oomph in there, and it would kind of give a little bit of that noise. But it, I mean, it wasn't always like making sure that you're doing that, you know, or, or, or slapping your your thigh. Uh, when when I was being trained, uh, I was I was taught the foot stomp 
is a super effective thing, especially yeah. when you're throwing a punch. You can do you can do a subtle foot stomp when you're you know doing a kick. Uh, you got somebody in the corner. You're you're doing a stomp in the corner. A subtle little. Uh, foot stomp goes a super long way because of the way the ring is designed and how it sounds. So it accentuates that. Uh, I, I see a lot of a, a lot of the workers and, and the younger workers slapping their thigh when they're doing a, a, a kick, uh, slapping their thigh when they're they're throwing a haymaker and, and different. You don't need to. Yeah. You don't need to because at some point. It, 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 somebody's gonna throw that haymaker and make a really great sound with it on the other person and it's just gonna blow that up even more because then people are gonna be like oh my god he actually freaking hit him <laughs> right well, guys back around here oh. used to call it the stomp and spew <laughs> where they yeah. would stomp their foot on the ring and they would do that sound <laughs> uh, or, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> whatever kind of noise they could make with their mouth yeah. I yeah. never saw guys slapping their legs until no. I don't yeah. know 15, 20 years ago, maybe yep, like yeah. early 2000s, something like that. Yep. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. That, that uh, was this thing yep. sound. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see how that kind of goes forward. Uh, honestly, it's something that um, I'd like to see maybe just even maybe just restricted to maybe the super kick. Cause I mean, you're already kind of in the midst of doing that, that motion. But other than that, Stop slapping your thighs, guys. We get it. We we get it. That's right. No graphic for the breaking news, but I just want to yeah. run through two things super sure. quickly. First off, I want to tell everybody how awesome Drew McIntyre is. He actually <laughs> gifted a custom WWE Championship title to the Scottish Premiership Champions Rangers FC for their championship win. Nice. Super fantastic. He did that on his own with custom side plates good for drew mcintyre second piece of quick breaking news jim ross has actually been interviewed for an upcoming episode of the dark side of the ring yep. and this one is going to be covering the plane ride from hell wow. so there we go another little insight into another episode that's going to be happening for dark side of the ring i am absolutely stoked for this new uh, third season of Dark Side of the Ring. There we go. Okay. There's my two quick breaking news that I wanted to make sure we awesome. got in. Cool. All right, let us go to our match of the week. All right, so for match of the week segment, since we've got you uh, this week here, Ryan, I'll let you go first. What was your favorite match in this past week? As far as the match is concerned, <laughs> I would have I would have gone with Omega and Moxley. You know, I mean, truthfully, mm -hmm. I, I thought they both sold like hell in that match. Mox bled like a dog. You know, did he ever? Um, uh, regardless of the finish, I thought those two guys, and and you know, that's not necessarily Omega's cup of tea to be doing a death match. Yeah, but I thought he held his own with Moxley. I thought it was a great match, and again, I guess. I, I'll, I'll call it my match of the week just because it'll be a day that lives in infamy, you know, kind of yep. like Pearl Harbor, <laughs> except no bombs went off. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing about it is, was it a great match? Yes, it was. Was the finish disappointing? Absolutely. Yep. But I thought those two guys tore the place down. There you go. How about you for yourself, Carl? Uh, quick, simple, easy, Darby Allen and Sting versus Brian Cage and Ricky Starks from uh, AEW Revolution. Uh, definitely, I, I loved that cinematic approach that they took with this matchup itself. I was very happy with it, and uh, that's my match of the week. Mighty Joe, yours? Mine, uh, interestingly enough, is something that has become a bit of a regular for, for me. It is coming from Ring of Honor's YouTube channel. Uh, as it's uh, throughout the course of the week, I watch a lot of free matches through Ring of Honor's YouTube channel. And this week is no different, guys. Uh, this is coming from 2018 from the Supercard of Honor show. We're talking Kota Bushi versus Hangman Page. Uh, this is an absolutely fantastic match. If you guys haven't had a chance to check it out... It's available for free on YouTube. You have no reason to not go and watch it. It's uh, about 18 minutes, so it's not too much time out of your day. Um, go watch a fantastic match. It's uh, one that uh, I highly recommend. It's something that we may even uh, cover on another show. We will see about that one. Well, see, this isn't fair because <laughs> OVW's Michael Melkor is coming to hang out and work at my office with me on Wednesday. So by the time I watch like five hours of OVW, <laughs> I may have like 15 matches of the week. So, <laughs> you never know. For sure. All right, guys. Well, let's, um, you know what? 
since we didn't uh, do any kind of sponsor, let's hear briefly from our friends over at CollinAndElbowBrand.com, and then we'll come back with our showstopper segment for this week. Wrestling. A love and a passion we all share. I've started a wrestling brand. The wrestling brand. A brand founded on the aspects of wrestling. Two entities working together to create a product that connect emotionally for people everywhere. Collar and Elbow is the brand. Passion and love for wrestling is the drive. I am Al Snow, and this is Collar and Elbow, the wrestling brand. Dictionary defines hero as a person who is admired or idealized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. Being a hero in life is far more than words printed on a page. It takes an unwavering code, a compass that points true north always. And in times like these, it takes sacrifice. Hero shouldn't be a word defined by a dictionary. It's a word that should be defined by the best of us. Hero has a new definition. Alright guys, Mighty Joe and Carl Careful and Ryan Cable and back here on Turnbuckle Talk. As you heard from our friends over at CollarAndElbowBrand.com, if you use promo code JK Podcast to check out, you'll get 10% off your entire purchase there. As usual, there's great uh, stuff over there. I'm not wearing uh, a shirt today, but uh, Carl, as usual, is wearing his Collar and Elbow hat and uh, the hoodie, which I believe uh, both of those are still available on the store. Yes. So there you go. Alright guys, let us get to our Showstopper segment. All right, for, so for this week's Showstopper segment, I thought um, it's a relatively easy one. I think that uh, we can uh, go around the table here, and, and uh, we're just going to go around and uh, give our picks for most underrated uh, male and female wrestlers of, of all time. Um, this is one that I had to think about a little bit, but uh, it should be an interesting discussion here. I'm going to throw it over to our guest, Mr. Ryan K. Bowman, first, and um, maybe we'll do male uh, go around and then we'll do female and kind of go around or we can just give both of our picks however we, we, we want to do it oh my gosh you guys are putting me on the spot honestly <laughs> I'll be straightforward and even though he's considered one of the greatest performers in the ring of all time you know what I always thought Kurt Hennig should have had a real run as the world champ- as that heel you know kind of snotty world champion uh, whether it was in the NWA or WWF at the time, um, he was just always a guy that I thought, and I know he had a run in AWA as the world champion, about a year, I think, in the AWA as the world champion until he lost to Jerry Lawler. But I always thought Kurt Hennig was one of those guys. And I'll tell you what, and I'm going to go 1-1A. One one the, the other guy that I think has always been underrated was Dean Malenko. Mm. I mean, just truly, if if – the best wrestler in the world was the guy who drew the most money. Then Dean Malenko would have headlined every pay per view in the yeah. world well, yeah, because sure. he was that good. Yeah. So those are two guys. I, I guess I was always a mark for the the technical wrestlers when I was a kid, yep. and those two always stuck out to me as just yep. being fantastic. Do you have a pick on the, on the women's side? Who Misty Blue Sims? Hmm. Google her. She was fantastic. I in like the, the name. 80s. Never, yeah. never, ever got a shot in the big time, but she wrestled in a lot of the NWA territories. One of the most underrated female performers ever. And also, and, and see, now I got it. You guys are going to make me have to do a top five. <laughs> That's now. okay. Ma- yeah. Malaya Hosaka would be on that list as mm. well. Another, sure. another performer who, unfortunately, in those days, you know, and, and I, I'm probably going to have this conversation with Dr. Tom tomorrow in the morning <laughs> when we talk, but in those days, you know, female wrestling was not like it is now. Now we have two or three matches in primetime national yep. TV with yeah. women featured. Back in, I, I hate to say back in my day, but <laughs> wrestlers like Medusa or Malaya yeah. or, or you know, some of the, the ladies that were in the LPWA, they might get featured on a major card once a month. There might be yeah. one female match once a month. So 
really, if you go back and look, wrestlers like Bambi, that's another name that could be could yep. be brought up. You know, a lot of those ladies really scrapped for theirs in the 80s and 90s, and they did not get the respect they deserved. Yep. What about you, Carl? Uh, favorite pick for male and female, uh, underrated of all time. All right. Well, you had asked for a top five from each, so I'll just run through the five <laughs> that I uh, have for underrated male wrestlers. You uh, asked for five. I will give you those. Hmm. Test. Billy Kidman, Norman Smiley, William Regal, and Alex Wright. So there oh, are my yeah, Alex is five. A good pick. That's a good pick. Alex oh, Wright. Right? Oh, my God. And he played that German character. And coming from a, a little bit of a German heritage background, I was like, yeah, that is my guy. 100%. That is my guy. Wait, wait so, hold on, Carl. You didn't put yourself on that list? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, no. I, you're highly underrated. <laughs> I, I, I I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> um, I do have to correct myself. You did not ask for top five. No, but, but you can I, if you want to. Yeah. I picked five anyways. Yeah. Um, so for my female wrestlers, I have got uh, Dana Brooke, Brooke Tessmacher, or Brooke Adams, mm-hmm. Serena Deeb, mm. Molly Holly, and Gail Kim. Oh, interesting. For, for me, I have it uh, narrowed down to just one pick uh, for each one, but I can probably think of some more. Uh, f- for me, for, for male wrestlers, actually, uh, I have the same pick as Ryan, actually. Uh, Mr. Perfect, I thought, was um, somebody who could have been... It almost doesn't feel fair to say so much more because, I mean, he was already fantastic. He was perfect, for lack of a better term. But uh, I, I would have loved to have seen him with, like, a world title run at some point uh, to have really gotten that big big push but i mean kurt was almost the kind of guy that you know didn't necessarily have to have that to really kind of be um that special so but uh, needless to say though i still feel that he was very very underrated and for for women for me it's mickey james uh i think that she's uh, somebody that um is much better than i think a lot of people give her credit for and is gone severely underused in the WWE, especially uh, her most recent run. Um, something that they could have done so much more. I think, especially if they would have positioned her in the, the NXT brand, I think she could have been uh, somebody to really kind of push that kind of going forward. And she could have had some great yeah. matches there too, instead of uh, just being an afterthought over on the the main roster, so to speak. I yeah. would also throw out former NWA World Champion Tim Storm. Mm. Oh yeah, important that he he didn't get a chance oh. in the spotlight until he was in his forties. For sure, you yeah. know, and that guy not only is just quality as a human being, but he was quality as a champion, and he was the guy that kind of helped carry that title into the Billy Corgan era with yes. the National Wrestling Alliance. So, uh, just absolutely, uh, if you guys ever get the chance to meet him, shake his hand. He is truly a a gentleman, one of the best guys, one of the greatest ambassadors pro wrestling could ever ask for. For So definitely an underrated guy. For sure. I would love to. Oh, and I mean, God, I would love. I to. mean, we could probably blow through like a big long list, but I would. I hate to Adam kind of Pierce, start, another guy. Uh, you know, very. Uh, that's that's a great I mean, example. Who, who, who never got uh, the spotlight whenever he was in his prime, and now he's being featured on TV every week. Yeah, right. For you know, sure. But, you know, but the scrap iron that I knew back in the day, he could go in the ring, yeah. and unfortunately, that was an era when the NWA title wasn't in the prominence that it has now, or it had before. There, there were a few. 10 or 15 really dark years for that belt. But there yeah. were a lot of guys like Blue Demon and Adam and, and Tim Storm that held that title proudly, and and they did did yep. it justice. Yeah, for sure. Frankly. So they yep. deserve a nod. And, and we if, meant- you're, if you're not following um, Adam Pierce, go and follow Adam Pierce because he is now putting out there onto his Facebook, his YouTube, everything – old matches that he has done to kind of get people yes. familiarized a little bit more with what he has actually done in the ring. And some of these matches, yeah, Tim Storm versus Adam Pierce, uh, one of them that he just recently put out there for everybody to watch. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. For sure. And I think you can make an argument for um, gentleman that we mentioned earlier in the program, uh, Christian. I think it's somebody that uh, could definitely fall into that co- category as well. I think we alluded to that earlier. So uh, somebody that uh, was uh, uh, you could make an argument for being underrated. Go ahead, Ryan. I got one more. I got one more. Sure. One guy, and you guys will have to go back to the 80s for this, but a guy that kind of, he was there for a while in Texas and Mid-South, Hollywood John Tatum. 
one of the great bad guys in the history of wrestling who just sort of at a certain point he he used to be I, I don't know if he was married to Missy Hyatt or if they were just dating but um they traveled together a lot during the 80s and John Tatum is another guy that was just a great great heel that for some reason or another never uh just like Iceman King Parsons another guy from Texas never really made that jump to the big time yep Yep, I would agree. And, and one other brief one that I'll mention too. I mean, this is something we could probably go forever on, but uh, yeah, to we uh, might have to do a whole show on this. <laughs> to, to to make a mention um, to our, our friend uh, Miss Kim Artlip, who was on our show recently, uh, her her favorite wrestler of all time, uh, I think, is somebody that is sorely underrated. Believe it or not, is Stan Hansen. Uh, somebody that uh, that people, if you're not aware of who he is, uh, just go watch the matches. I mean, absolutely freaking amazing. So, uh, Stan and was the throw man. A half blind lariat. Oh yeah. Devastating. Devastating. <laughs> Devastating. All right, guys. Well, that about wraps up here for this week. But before we go, um, Ryan, what do you got going on over at Sports Kita these days? Just got done. Uh, we, we just dropped the first clip from my interview with Impact World Champion Rich Swan. Uh, I've got the full length story coming out. Got my column, The Power of the Pen. I'm not going to tell anybody what it's about because I think this one's going to be a good one. Um, and uh, just, yeah, check me out over at sportskeeda.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ryan K. Bowman. Follow me on Facebook at Ryan K. Bowman. And always follow me when I get to hang out with my friends Joe and Carl on Turnbuckle Talk. Absolutely. Carl, uh, what do you want to uh, plug and promote before we head out for today? Uh, plug and promo today, just uh, as we had uh, during our commercial, CollarAndElbowBrand.com. Go and check them out. They've got clearance sale going on right now. Make sure you go and take advantage of that clearance sale. Use promo code JKPODCAST at the checkout. You're going to get 10% off the already clearanced pricing. Go and check them out at CollarAndElbowBrand.com. We can't forget about our friends over at Phoenix as well. FNXFit.com. Great supplements over there for whatever you were looking for, whether it's a testosterone your own boost whether it is super greens whether it's protein powder you name it they got it over there plus some amazing workout gear as well for you to go and feel comfortable while you're working out go and check them out fnxfit.com use our promo code tb talk pod you're going to get 15 percent off your entire order that's with our friends over at fnxfit.com can i go ahead and mention uh our show tomorrow this time yeah, for sure. And uh, just a brief disclaimer: I am not slowly turning into a ghost. Uh, just the, the 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 sun is shining bright through the window just above uh, my studio here. So just for people worried for my safety and see me kind of bleaching out here, uh, it's just the sun. I'm not slowly turning into something different. So make sure that you are checking out lovewrestling.ca. This Thursday is going to drop our next episode of Turnbuckle Rewind. And people, I am excited for this because this is my favorite of all the times. We are going to be looking at, I'm sorry, I love you. The matchup between Ric Flair and Sean Michaels, my two favorite competitors, male competitors of all time in a final matchup with so much emotion. It is going to be <laughs> off the chain. I am super excited for this, but definitely go to lovewrestling.ca. So much great programming over there, including Turnbuckle Rewind, and you can follow all of their social media. All the links are available there at lovewrestling.ca. And Joe, before you sign off, I just want to give some advice out to both of you. Yes. yes. Joe, mighty Joe. Yes. Get a spray tan. Carl, <laughs> shave that beard, you dirty hippie. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll I love you both. We'll see. I'm, I'm just giving both of you crap. Yeah. If I, if I do get a can of spray tan, I'll have to apply it while we're live on the air. <laughs> just to... <laughs> if Papa Bear didn't Patreon. give us any crap, we'd be worried. <laughs> you know, we, hey, Joe, if you're going to spray tan live, we can put it on Patreon and maybe make right. it. Right there, we go. There we go. On that note, everybody, it's been a <laughs> it's been a fun episode. We'll see you guys on the next one. Speed!
Saints that are to be the beat. As you can tell in the background, we are out celebrating. That is what we do here at HittingTheParks.com. And I invite everyone to continue to tune in to Turnbuckle Talk, but check out all of our other shows. We have content, especially led up by the flagship show. You can find that all at HittingTheParks.com. Run. Thank you.